Hey everyone, it's me, John. Welcome to an episode of Brain Scratch. Um, feeling a little jilted this week, so I don't know how deep we're going to go into this case, but it's kind of rough when you find out that someone you looked up to as a childhood hero of yours um, might not be all that you cracked them up to be. And it's strange because there's been a few times in my life where I've been fortunate enough to meet some people that I have looked up to, uh, particularly in terms of actors, and sometimes it's disappointing. There's just this um, wall of reality that kind of happens sometimes between who a person is in front of the camera and who they are outside of that. And I think that definitely comes into play when we talk about today's case, the case of Jimmy Superfly Snuka. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Jimmy Snuka, um, especially if you were children of the 80s at all. He was there in what I consider the heyday of the WWF at that time. Now it's called the WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment. Um, but the 80s was a real special time for wrestling. We had you know, Hulk Hogan, we had Andre the Giant, we had all these people that have turned into cultural icons and in some cases um, kind of uh, cultural not quite demons I don't think is the right word but you know I don't know what status uh, Hulk Hogan is at <laughs> nowadays it's pretty tough to tell with a lot of the turmoil that he has gone through um, but even in that case we're talking about the same dynamic here you know there is something very different about who Hulk Hogan was in front of the camera when he was in a wrestling ring versus uh, some of the stuff about his personal life that has come out since. And in Jimmy's case, we have a very big problem in terms of his legacy. And that big problem is, did he murder a woman in 1983? So we're going to look into that today. We're going to touch briefly on his past um, and then try to look into some of the details around that case. There is still somewhat of a mystery um, to, to kind of figure out in all this, and we'll touch on that at the end. And then, of course, I'll ask for all of your opinions and comments. Um, but before we get started, this video is the WWE honoring his life. And apparently this is a segment that they ran on Monday Night Raw this week. And if you scroll down to the comments on this video, we already see a bit of the problem that I'm talking about. Uh, first of all, I've watched this whole video. It's a very nice segment uh, about his wrestling career in particular and his family that has continued in wrestling. Um, but right here on the top comment, RIP to Jimmy Snuka and that lady he killed that one time. And the second comment isn't much better. It looks like it's left from uh, PC Principal from South Park. Uh, remember kids, you can kill someone and stay in the Hall of Fame, but just don't say the N-word without knowing you're being filmed. Of course, referring to some of the trouble Hulk Hogan bumped into. Um, however, I think that comment's incorrect because Jimmy Snuka was actually removed from the Hall of Fame as well as the WWE website. That is kind of a typical move that they seem to take when one of their stars um, becomes a bit too controversial. So let's jump into the story and see what we can learn. Heading over to Wikipedia, James Ryher Snuka, born James Wiley Smith, better known by the ring name Jimmy Superfly Snuka, was a Fijian professional wrestler and actor. He was inducted into the WWF Hall of Fame in 1996. He really had an amazing career. He began wrestling uh, in 1970, kind of worked his way up to the WWF, and then in January of 1982, he entered the WWF uh, as a villain, and he was working with the manager, Captain Lou Albano, who, if you're a fan of the 80s WWF, you know very well. He managed a bunch of great wrestlers. Um, but here is just a quick little clip of the introduction, Jimmy's first entrance into the WWF. The opponent hails from the Fiji Islands. He weighs 250 pounds. Here he is, Jimmy Superfly Saluka. And of course, what he was known for, especially with the name Superfly, was a jump he would do off of the top turn buckle. Let's just... before. Wait till you see what he does. Oh my goodness. 
very physical performer and um, one of the early wrestling flyboys, I guess you can call him. Um, there are certain wrestlers that kind of specialize in those types of aerial moves, and he influenced basically a whole generation of other wrestlers uh, by doing that. And it appears that it was pretty tough on his body. There are some interviews where other wrestlers are discussing uh, some of the pain that he was dealing with. Basically, his elbows and knees were shot from landing those. And at some point, he was even asking the other wrestlers to try to catch him as he was coming down so that it could brace some of that impact on his elbows and knees. He was so popular that in the first ever WrestleMania in March of 1985, Snuka acted as a corner man for Hulk Hogan and Mr. T when they defeated Rowdy Roddy Piper and Paul Orndorff. I mean, he just had a solid career. He was basically working the whole time. Even when he would weave out of the WWF, he would go to independent wrestling and continue working. Snooker received a Lifetime Achievement Award from WWE in 2002 at Madison Square Garden. Also in the early 2000s, he was participating at X Wrestling Federation, accompanying his son, Jimmy Snooker Jr., to the ring for matches, including one match where they both delivered the Superfly Splash. And finally, Snooker made an appearance in an old school edition of Raw in November 2010, where he stood by his daughter, Tamina, which would be his final WWE appearance though Snuka continued wrestling on the independent circuit until mid-2015. He appeared in 10 video games, he appeared in a cartoon about the World Wrestling Federation, he wound up writing an autobiography, Superfly, the Jimmy Snuka story, published in December of 2012. He was married three times, and then you see his Wikipedia page has a pretty lengthy segment on the Nancy Argentino death. On May 10th of 1983, a few hours after defeating Jose Estrada at a WWF TV taping in Allentown, Pennsylvania, Snuka placed a call for an ambulance. Nancy died shortly after of undetermined craniocerebral injuries. The coroner's report stated that Argentino, 23, died of traumatic brain injuries consistent with a moving head striking a stationary object. Autopsy findings show Argentino suffered more than two dozen cuts and bruises, a possible sign of mate abuse, on her head, ear, chin, arms, hands, back, buttocks, legs, and feet. Forensic pathologist Isidore Mihalakis, who performed the autopsy, wrote at the time that the case should be investigated as a homicide until proven otherwise. Snuka was the only suspect involved in the subsequent investigation. Although charges were not pressed at the time against Snuka, the case was left officially open. In 1985, Argentino's parents won a $500,000 default judgment against Snuka in U.S. District Court in Philadelphia. That was a civil trial. Uh, Snuka appears not to have ever paid, claiming financial inability to do so. On June 28, 2013, Lehigh County District Attorney Jim Martin announced that the still open case would be reviewed by his staff. On January 28, 2014, Martin announced that the case had been turned over to a grand jury. On September 1, 2015, 32 years after the incident, Snuka was arrested and charged with third-degree murder and involuntary manslaughter for Argentino's death. On November 2, Snuka pleaded not guilty before Judge Kelly Banach. A hearing to determine Snuka's competency for trial began in May 2016. Snuka's attorneys argued that a forensic psychologist found Snuka's mental and physical health to be deteriorating. Prosecutors countered by showing a tape of Snuka performing wrestling moves at a May 2015 match. On June 1, 2016, Judge Banach ruled that Snuka was not mentally competent to stand trial for the murder and that a new hearing would be held six months later to reevaluate his competency though his attorneys maintain that his condition wouldn't improve over time. Judge Kelly Banach dismissed the charges on January 3, 2017, deeming Snuka not mentally fit to stand trial. In August of 2015, Snuka's wife, Carol, announced that he was diagnosed with stomach cancer. That was actually brought up by his attorneys as well, and I believe that's part of the reason why the judge dismissed the case. They were basically saying that he only had a matter of months to live uh, I think they said about six months, but um, he actually wound up dying only about 12 days after the case was dismissed. 
Outside of that, I do believe this other case is still rolling forward. In July of 2016, Snuka, represented by his wife, was part of a class action lawsuit filed against WWE, which alleged that wrestlers incurred long-term neurological injuries and that the company routinely failed to care for them and fraudulently misrepresented and concealed the nature and extent of those injuries. Already a tragic story in one way. I mean, even if you're just looking at this man in terms of his career, but now you have the personal side to look at as well. And this big question about what happened on that night back in 1983, and is there any way to really review it? Luckily there is. Part of the reason why this case came back and was brought to the grand jury was because of new information that had come out. One of those things being the book that he had written and some comments that he made in that book about what happened on that night. Outside of that, there was an article written that really does a really detailed job about going into the events as they were reported and noted by several different people. Uh, it's a bit of a lengthy article, but we're going to go through it and I'm going to try to hit some of the highlights of it and share those with you so hopefully we can come to some determination about this. But what's tough about this right from the get-go is he is the only suspect for a very good reason. Um, she was spending time with him that day. They were traveling together. Uh, they got to a hotel together. He went to do his job. He came back and essentially found, according to him, found her on the bed. Um, and she had yellow liquid coming out of her nose and mouth. Uh, I believe she was unconscious at the time. He called for an ambulance. So there's really no other culprit to look at in this situation. What we're really trying to determine here is, is his story about it being accidental true versus what some of the evidence seems to point to, which is this is more of a domestic violence issue that may have gone too far. YouTube channel The Hannibal TV has done a really good job of interviewing some of the wrestlers that knew him back at that time and trying to get their point of view on this case. Uh, we're going to start with just a small clip here from the Honky Tonk Man about what he thinks. I don't think Jimmy had anything to do with that. I don't, I don't believe that at all. I know Jimmy too well. I know he's not that kind of person. The Hannibal TV also has an interview with Hacksaw Jim Duggan about it. When there's that much smoke, there must be a little fire, I think and tag team demolition. I hope it's not true. I don't know if it's true. But Jimmy's gone through a lot. You know, he fought cancer. And we saw him, what, about a year ago. He's deteriorated, and this is added to it. If you're a fan of wrestling from back in those days, I can tell you, you might want to check out the Hannibal TV and watch these interviews uh, in full. There's a lot of additional information that you will get about the industry, about how these guys work together. Um, they speak very highly of Jimmy in terms of him being in the ring. They said he was a very careful wrestler, um, that he was very gentle in the moves that he would execute with them. Um, so there's a lot more insight to be gained from this. I recommend you check that out for yourself. But as you can see just from these three clips, um, people are very divided. I believe it's, it comes down to belief. I, I think that people are divided because they don't want to think that he was that type of person, um, particularly with the Honky Tonk Man interview. Him and the Honky Tonk Man actually worked together for quite a bit for a while as they were fighting each other. Um, so it's strange. Uh, I think Hacksaw says it well, where there's smoke, there's fire. And unfortunately, Jimmy also had some other charges of domestic abuse. I believe one that was related to uh, his first wife, as well as a Another charge that was related directly to Nancy Argentino um, that had occurred only four months before she had died. Now, The Morning Call is um, the publication that came out with an article, I believe it was in 2013, that kind of helped stir things back up in terms of this case. Um, they've written another article since, and we're going to kind of do this in reverse order. So we're looking at the newest article first. This is from September of 2015, um, and we do have some pictures here. Here we have a photo of Jimmy with Nancy, and down here a photo of Nancy on her own. According to this article, his book, Superfly, The Jimmy Snooker Story, was meant to highlight his Hall of Fame career, but Lehigh County authorities say it also helped crack a 32-year-old mystery. 
the death of Snuka's 23-year-old girlfriend, Nancy Argentino, after she was found unconscious in a Whitehall Township motel. Quote, his assaultive acts and his failure to act to obtain medical attention resulted in her death, the grand jury wrote in a presentment July 17th, recommending he be charged with homicide. So the grand jury charged him, um, it looks like, with third-degree murder, which means a killing with malice. It carries a maximum sentence of 20 to 40 years in prison. And the DA, Jim Martin, said the case didn't warrant a first-degree murder charge, which applies to a killing that is both willful and premeditated. Snooker was subpoenaed to testify before the grand jury, Martin said. He appeared with his lawyer, but didn't testify. The grand jury reviewed police reports, medical and autopsy evidence, and the statements Snooka made in media interviews and in his 2012 autobiography about what happened to Argentino. In the book, Snooka wrote how his personal life began, quote, getting a little crazy in 1983 because of his frequent use of alcohol, steroids, and cocaine. Argentino had regularly traveled with Snooka on the burgeoning pro wrestling circuit, while he had a wife and four children in North Carolina. So yes, she was indeed a mistress of his. Um, apparently she was kind of into the World Wrestling Federation. There is some mention that at one point she also at least had one date with Hulk Hogan. On May 10th, 1983, Snuka was at a taping of a then World Wrestling Federation event at the Allentown Fairgrounds. He returned to the George Washington Motor Lodge motel room to find Argentino gasping for air and oozing yellow fluid from her mouth and nose, court records say. Paramedics arrived at the motel and found Snuka, a police officer, and two wrestlers there, according to court records. Argentino was unconscious, barely breathing, and her dilated pupils and rapid heart rate indicated she had a head injury and was likely in shock, court records say. Argentino was pronounced dead at a Lehigh Valley Hospital emergency room the next day. Besides the medical evidence, one of the biggest factors for the charges, Martin said, was Snuka's inconsistent statements. Snuka originally told at least five people, including the responding police officer, he shoved Argentino earlier that day, causing her to fall and hit her head. He later told police those five people misunderstood him and said Argentino slipped and hit her head when they stopped along the highway to urinate. After Argentino died, though, Snuka spoke to a hospital chaplain and to the detective, giving both men different accounts of how she died. He told the chaplain that Argentino told him she had a headache when they got to the motel and wanted to go to bed. He went to a diner and got them food, even though Argentino said she wasn't hungry. Snuka stated the victim passed out in the room and hit her head on the side of the chair or bed. He kept checking on her and she was breathing okay, according to the presentment. The wrestler said he left for work in the afternoon, came back, then left again to tape a television show. When he came back around 9 p.m., yellow stuff was coming out of her nose and mouth. He knew something was obviously wrong and called for help from an ambulance. Snuka gave seven versions of Argentino's death that night and morning, and the grand jury learned of, quote, several additional versions and explanations in the years since from Snuka's autobiography and from two radio show podcasts. In the book, Snuka also discussed his arrest on charges of assaulting Argentino on January 18, 1983, in a hotel near Syracuse, New York, four months before Argentino's death. Snuka's account differed from the official police account. The grand jury also heard testimony from Snuka's former wife, Sharon Rihar Snuka, who is now remarried. She told the panel about a series of beatings she sustained during arguments with her husband in the fall of 1983 that resulted in her being hospitalized. In his autobiography, Snuka maintained his innocence and said Argentino's death ruined his life. Quote, many terrible things have been written about me hurting Nancy and being responsible for her death, but they are not true, he wrote. This has been very hard on me and very hard on my family. To this day, I get nasty notes and threats. It hurts. I never hit Nancy or threatened her. I don't know about you guys, but for me, just looking at the history here, um, you know, we have a wife talking about being beaten and hospitalized. We have a charge against him for four months prior to this. Uh, admittedly, I think they settled those charges. He had to make a donation, and they, um, I think because Nancy probably didn't want to press charges, they were able to reduce those significantly. Um, but 
It's just so strange to me when I think of what I know of him from his TV persona. This is a person that was usually very, very quiet. Like I hardly even remember him speaking. And to hear about accounts like this, um, where it seems like he is just raging and letting it out against women, uh, is very troubling to me personally. Now jumping over to the morning call, um, this is the actual article that helped kind of re-kick this thing into uh, being investigated. This was published June 18th of 2013, and I believe in this article is the first time that they were able to go over details of the autopsy report. Up till this point, the autopsy report had never been released. Um, this article is very lengthy, but there's a lot of really good detail in it, so I just want to go through some of that with you, including who Nancy was, kind of a little bit of backstory into her. Nancy Argentino was a Brooklyn girl. She was a good student, optimistic and outgoing, according to her sisters. Quote, I always admired her because she had a fun spirit, said Lorraine Salome, who is six years older than Nancy and the oldest of the three sisters. She didn't have any trouble relating to people. People were drawn to her. She was just fun to be around. Nancy was Italian, five feet seven inches tall, 115 pounds, with dark curly hair and brown eyes. It wasn't long before she caught the eyes of the wrestlers. Nancy wasn't looking for a free ride, her sisters say, but she liked nice things and wanted the best for herself. Jimmy Snuka could provide that, and the couple started dating in 1982. About 16 years Snuka's junior, Nancy was the star wrestler's travel companion, guide, and, quote, East Coast girlfriend, as he refers to her in his book. Nancy didn't know that Snuka was married and had a wait-and-see attitude about an engagement. They were planning to move into a condo together, and Snuka had bought her a ring and told her he loved her in front of the family. Now we're going to get into some of the events of that night um, as kind of retold by other people. Remember, according to his story, he basically kept going back to check on her, but we're going to find out pretty soon that uh, in the middle of all that, he decided to go hang out with his friends and have some drinks as well. When the WWF finished its tapings at Allentown's Ag Hall on May 10, 1983, Snooker returned to the George Washington Motor Lodge to drink beers with his on-camera rival Don Morocco and fellow wrestler Mr. Fuji, according to Whitehall police records, which were subpoenaed for the 1985 civil case. Morocco and Fuji told police in their interview that Snooker told them his girlfriend was not feeling well and he wanted to return to his room to check on her condition. By the time Snooka walked into room 427, Nancy was almost dead. From here, it goes into all the different ways that he told this story to different people. Um, one of those is that him and Nancy were fooling around outside the hotel room, and he pushed her, and she fell, striking her head. There's a version that looks like it takes place in the room, where he says that they were fooling around, and she was pushed and fell backwards and struck her head. And then uh, he actually wound up giving her light slaps to the face to bring her back around. But he maintained um, that his version of the story, and that other people got this all incorrect, but his version was that uh, they pulled over after she had to go to the bathroom while they were driving there. Uh, she went a little into the bushes and squatted, he said, according to police records. In the meantime, there were a lot of trucks coming by, so I said, hurry up. And she jumped across the grass onto the road, and then she slipped and fell backward and hit her head right on the concrete on the side of the road. She just slipped backward. Snooker told police Nancy had a real bad concussion. When I saw that, I just picked her up and slapped her across the face to get her to come to again, he said. The police detectives asked him about the discrepancies in all these stories, and he basically said, no, 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 those other five people got it wrong. I was telling them that we liked to play around. I wasn't saying that that's what happened on this particular occasion. So uh, there's just a ton of conflicting stories around this night, and it's weird that they all seem to be coming from him. Uh, in terms of her funeral service, um, Snuka attended Nancy's viewing and cried while leaning over the casket, according to Caroline Argentino's police interview. Uh, the family believed Snuka would come back for the funeral the next day, and he never showed up. And at this point, the case kind of goes cold. And I have a lot of questions about this part of it. Um, when you have all these different stories being told, um, aren't you gonna start digging in and trying to research whichever one is true? 
if they did have her fall somewhere on a road somewhere, could the detectives have asked, hey, you know, Mr. Snuka, take us back to that location, show us where this fall happened? Could they have tried to done some, do some forensic testing to prove that they were actually there at that point? Um, I don't know. And in particular, for the stories that take place in the hotel room, uh, if he says that you know she hit her head on a chair or on the bed or something like that, isn't there some way to look at those areas and see if you can find some hair fibers or maybe some blood? Um, and really, the main problem I have with all of his stories are, yes, they are all addressing a serious head wound, which obviously was her demise, but that's not the only thing that the coroner noted. There were contusions all over this woman's body. I mean, literally from head to toe, this woman was either bruised or cut. So um, why the detectives did not use some of that information to try to press things with him a little bit further, I don't know. Honestly, the thing I'm most shocked by is that this case sat for 30 years before it was brought to a grand jury, because I think they had all the relevant information back at that time. It just seems like no one took the initiative to try to push that forward and see if they could process it at that time. Now, one of the things that was probably tough about the case, um, here we're going back to the person that conducted the autopsy. He says, quote, I did not have a clear cut case. It was a very worrisome case. Obviously there was enough there to arouse my suspicion, but not enough to take it to trial. Just because she was beaten doesn't mean she was beaten to death. I still have some trouble with that because I've read several autopsy reports and they can be pretty specific about when wounds occur. I mean, even bruises, you can kind of tell if they're recent or not. If the wounds coincide in terms of timing with the head wound, I think that it would be reasonable to think that a judge or a jury might conclude that the head wound was part of the beating that happened to that woman as well. But that's my totally unprofessional opinion. Nancy's father, Ralph, passed away in 1999. Her mother, Caroline, now 87, moved to Florida. For years, Caroline Argentino never changed Nancy's bedroom, leaving it as a shrine to her daughter. She still has a collection of photos she keeps as a makeshift memorial. The family also has the old photos of Jimmy and Nancy and the hospital bill that lists altercation as the reason for Nancy's injuries. Though 30 years have passed, the sisters still believe police didn't do enough to find out how Nancy died. And I think I might agree with them. Um, just wanted to leave you with this note from another article about all this at theringer.com. Um, this sentence really just kind of sums it up for me and in a bit of a unique way. The fake world taking precedence over the real world, that's pro wrestling in a nutshell. And I think part of the undertone there is, um, I almost feel like wrestlers are very good improvisation artists. I do not believe that they script out word for word what they're going to say, um, punch for punch when those matches are going on. I don't think those things are scripted out second to second. Um, they have to think on their feet. They have to know how to tell a story. And I believe that some of those talents and skills might be being employed by Jimmy in this case. Um, and that's part of the reason why his story is changing as he's telling it to different people. It is kind of just his natural mode. It's his career. It's what he had done for, I think, 40 years, maybe even close to 50 years. So... Um, you know, using the tools that you are already familiar with seems to make some sense to me, but it is tragic. It's tragic for this family that had to wait for decades for some type of justice. And just when justice looked like it was about to show up, the culprit um, decided to leave. And even that in some way is still heavy and kind of dark for me. Um, because it doesn't really give Jimmy a chance to, um, not that he could kind of atone for his sins, but it doesn't really give him a chance to become a better person at any point either. You know, did he really learn a lesson from killing this woman and getting away with it? I don't think so. I know, I know some people out there are probably thinking, well, you know, he became sick and that is the universe's way of exacting justice uh, upon him. Perhaps, perhaps it is, um, but I would just, 
I don't know, I personally would have felt better about it if he would have actually faced the charges. Perhaps someday he could have admitted to what he had done, um, and maybe that story could be remembered by others and stop further occurrences of domestic abuse or violence against women um, for other people. But instead, what we're left with is childhood memories of a figure that is, I, I have to separate in my mind. I have to just separate it and say, Jimmy Superfly Snuka on WWF is a character. And there are things about that that I can appreciate and remember, but Jimmy Snuka, the person, was a whole different thing. It's kind of the same lesson I feel like I've had to learn in terms of uh, meeting actors and realizing that they are clearly not the characters that they portray. Uh, in some cases, they are extremely, extremely different. So I think that's where we leave it. Now, the big questions are, what do you guys think? Was this truly an accident? Is one of those accidental scenarios he's talking about, are those feasible? Uh, or did he really get away with um, abusing this woman literally to death? I think those are really the big questions that we're left with in this case. Um, I don't know. For me, unfortunately, there's just, it's too odd having all these different stories. It's too odd having that much evidence in terms of her autopsy and the damage that it looks like her body uh, took on that particular day. Um, I find it very hard to believe that this was not something that just got out of hand, went too far. And you even have Jimmy admitting to using, abusing alcohol, cocaine, and steroids at that time. Did he work himself up into some kind of rage that uh, he then tried to escape from? I don't know. I don't know. Before I go, I just have to thank Jason Evans. He actually wanted me to cover this case a while ago. Um, I was waiting to see how it shook out because I really would have liked to finish this episode with, you know, hey, they concluded he was guilty. He is serving 20 years, whatever. Um, but unfortunately, we're not going to have that clean of a finish on this case. But Jason is a big WWE slash WWF fan. Uh, he even got to meet Hacksaw Jim Duggan just last weekend and was sure to tweet me about that. So thank you so much, Jason, for helping me reach back into my childhood a little bit. It was kind of fun to see some footage from the good old glory days, um, see some footage about these wrestlers and you know how we're all aging together now. Um, but it was also a very tough day to dig into this story, and I feel terrible for uh, Nancy's family and what they've had to endure for all these years, and I just hope that at least knowing that the grand jury did indict him, that he was going to face those charges, is enough for them to know that justice was very rapidly coming. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here on Brain Scratch. I hope every one of you out there has a wonderful weekend. I'll catch you next week back here on the Lord and Arch channel. Take care, everyone.